I have protected every living president. Carter. Clinton. Bush. Obama. Trump. Biden. But nothing could have prepared me for January 6th, 2021. We're trying to get compliance, but this is now effectively a riot. 49 hours declaring it a riot. I have been in policing for almost 30 years. The events I witnessed on January 6th was the worst attack on law enforcement and our democracy that I've seen in my entire career. We were repeatedly being told by the uh, National Guard at the national level that we did not have authorization. Who blocked the National Guard from coming to the aid of my officers on January 6th? Why didn't the FBI and Department of Homeland Security issue a joint intelligence bulletin regarding January 6th threats? What was Mike Pence thinking while the Capitol was under siege? I should know, I was protecting him on January 6th. But I never thought I'd be protecting Vice President Pence from President Trump. Multiple capital entry! Multiple capital entry! On January 6th, there was one Capitol Police officer for every 58 insurrectionists. Courage under fire, under siege and outnumbered 58 to 1 on January 6th by Stephen A. Sund, former chief of the U.S. Capitol Police. Dance has become a form of protest in Iran. People are dancing everywhere. They are dancing in classrooms, in malls, in sports stadiums. Take a look. <laughs> like I was telling you, this is not a new TikTok rage. The dance is a form of protest. Iranians are protesting against their government. While dancing in public spaces is normal in the era of reels and stories, in Iran, dancing is frowned upon. In fact, dancing between men and women in public is banned. You will find this ironic if you followed Persian culture. You see, song and dance, along with food, have been an integral part of Iranian history. Be it Yalda, the, win the winter solstice, or Noruz, the Persian New Year. Dances are always a part of Persian festivity, but things have changed under the clerics. A year ago in the city of Rasht, this old man broke into a dance at a fish market. 70-year-old Sadek Bana Motijad said that his dance was meant to make people happy. As you can imagine, this dance did not go down well with the Iranian regime. Twelve men who appeared in the video were picked up by the police. Reports say these men were blindfolded and beaten. They also had to sign a pledge. It read they will never sing and dance in public again. Mothi Jadid's Instagram page was scrubbed off its content. All posts were deleted. The profile picture was replaced by the emblem of the Iranian judiciary. A new post read, this page has been shut down for creating criminal content. It added that the person engaged in the activity has quote-unquote been dealt with. You see, Mothe Jadid is pretty popular in Rasht. People call him Boogie, which in Persian stands for megaphone. For years, he has been going to stadiums with a megaphone and cheering the fans. <laughs> When the news got out of what happened to the old man, it spread like wildfire. The police did not help with its actions. Cops went around cracking down on street musicians and confiscating their music instruments. This angered people all the more. They accused the government of cracking down on happiness. People started protesting. They began filming themselves dancing to the song that the old man had grooved to. 
the protests picked up. People began recreating his dance moves. They started dancing everywhere, classrooms, malls, stadiums. The AFC or the Asia Football Confederation's official Farsi page posted a video of Iranian football players dancing to the song as well. Has the government reacted to all of this? Authorities have been forced to pull back. Mote Jadid's Instagram page has been restored. The cops have issued a statement. The police say that the old man was never arrested. I'll just say this. Dancers won. Iranian authorities nil. I love the violin. I think a lot of people see a broken thing and they just think it's broken. It could be anything. Maybe it's public schools. Or maybe it's the United States or any other part of the world. Maybe it's just a $20 fiddle found out to swap me. But when we see a broken thing, we think, oh, with a little something here, a little something there, we can fix the part that's broken and make things whole again. It's difficult work. But no matter what, you do whatever it takes because... Fixing stuff is one of the best things that humans do. That's why this is not just a musical instrument repair shop. When an instrument breaks, there's a student without an instrument. No, no, no. Not in our city. Even if they don't know me, we know it could change their whole life. With big storms come big waves and big time surf. And there's no place bigger than Mavericks and Half Moon Bay. The waves looked absolutely massive and it was everything that uh, we expected. It was really big, I would say maybe 40 to 60 foot waves. Miguel Blanco flew into town all the way from Portugal to surf the historic waves of Mavericks. It was difficult to see from our vantage point on the shoreline, but this incredible footage shot in the water gave us a look at what the brave surfers were able to see. I can't imagine what it's like staring at a 40-foot wave and dropping in. If it's your turn, then you just got to go, you know? Like when you see a big wave, you're kind of scared, but at the same time, you're, you're feeling like you should go, and you go, and you just go and enjoy the ride. For local Ion Banner, he wished he didn't have to share incredible waves like these with everyone else, but he recognizes the legacy of Maverick spans the small surf town of Princeton and Half Moon Bay. That's uh, like pretty gnarly. I mean, it's super big. People from all over uh, Portugal, Brazil, Tahiti, Hawaii, a Kailani and his brother out there. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of uh, amazing surfing going down. HBO was on hand creating a documentary of the day's events, but a look through the sails and mist shows crowds of spectators here to catch the action as well. We're seeing some huge swells, big waves, and some surfers that are crazy going out there. It was crazy enough to just watch the surfing, but hundreds took the two-mile walk to the coastline from the town to line up and down the steep cliffs of the beach. San Mateo County officials did what they can to suggest people stay away, but these waves brought them to the Bay Area from far and wide. It's amazing. Yeah, we're pretty lucky here. Pretty special place we live in. It certainly is. I mean, it might become a um, yearly event for the Solways. And when you see this, the question isn't why, it's why not. At Mavericks in Half Moon Bay, Dustin Dorsey, ABC 7 News.
Israel's military says it has accidentally killed three of the hostages kidnapped by Hamas during its October 7 terror attacks. The three Israelis were reportedly shot after being mistaken as a threat by soldiers pursuing Palestinian militants in Gaza City. The loved ones of those kidnapped are demanding immediate return of the remaining hostages and say their safety must be prioritized over the fighting. News of the hostage killings galvanized demonstrators in Tel Aviv. Roads were blocked as hundreds demanded the safe return of those still in Gaza 10 weeks after they were kidnapped. With much of the anger directed at Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. I would say that he, re he is responsible for everything that is happening, that happened and, and is still happening. He has blood, a lot of blood on his hands and he should resign now. The Israeli government, uh, they said they do every, everything. They say that uh, the hostages is first uh, in their considerations, but it doesn't seem like this, it doesn't look like this terrible tragedy and I think um, a deal should have been made much, much earlier and all those lives of, of all the innocent people could have been spared. The three hostages killed by Israeli soldiers were all young men in their 20s. Israel's military expressed deep sorrow over the killings and said it was investigating the incident. We believe that the three Israelis either fled or were abandoned by the terrorists who held them captives. Israel's intense land and air bombardment of Gaza has now killed more than 18,800 Palestinians, according to Hamas-run health authorities. With more than 100 Israeli hostages still in Gaza, there's growing scrutiny over how Israel's government plans to bring them home safely without even more civilians being killed in the crossfire. Ever wonder how your dinner plate impacts the planet? It's a question worth pondering, especially when digging into a juicy chicken breast or a slice of savory cheese. You see, these seemingly innocuous food items have a far-reaching effect on our environment, particularly on our precious groundwater resources. The United States, a nation known for its love affair with chicken and cheese, has seen a marked increase in their consumption. This seemingly harmless preference, however, has been leading to a significant drain on underground water supplies. Why, you ask? Well, it's all linked to the feed that fuels our tasty poultry and dairy favorites. Farmers, in their drive to meet demand, have been turning to groundwater to grow animal feed. This has resulted in an expansion of farms in regions already grappling with limited water resources. Take, for instance, Arkansas. Once a cotton kingdom, it is now transformed into a soybean haven to feed the billion chickens that dominate the region's economy. And it's not just Arkansas. Idaho, once famous for its potatoes, now stands as the largest producer of alfalfa. And it's not for their love of the plant, but to feed cows for cheese production. Growing these water-intensive crops has led to an overuse of groundwater in areas like Texas, California's Central Valley, Kansas, and Arizona. The depletion of aquifers, which supply a whopping 90% of America's water systems, is a looming threat to the country's food supply. A stark example of this is Idaho's Magic Valley. The region where dairy farms and cheese factories have flourished has seen a severe decline in water levels. And it's not just a domestic issue. Chicken and cheese consumption isn't a uniquely American phenomenon. Exports of poultry, dairy, and animal feed have risen significantly since 1980. This means the impact of animal agriculture on aquifers extends far beyond American borders, contributing to a global environmental footprint. The impact of our food choices on our water resources is a less discussed aspect of food production's environmental footprint. It's a silent crisis, hiding beneath the surface, quite literally. And while it might seem like a drop in the ocean, remember, each drop counts. In conclusion, the next time you take a bite of that chicken sandwich or a nibble of that cheese cube, Remember the journey it's taken. It's not just a journey from the farm to your plate, but also one that's draining our planet's precious resources. A food for thought, isn't it?
يوم الخميس امبارح يعني واجهنا صعوبات كبيره كثير في تامين المصادر الكراستا اللي كنا احنا المفروض نوردها للطبخ اليوم There are hundreds of cars here uh, everybody is waiting in line to get in Pues aquí nos asustó un huracán categoría 5 Did you expect this kind of disaster? Uh, not on the scale of this Упала ракета прямо в хату. Люди в нас працьовиті, і люди не можуть без урожаю оставити. Це теж. It's been 10 months that they are blocked, malnourished, sick, kids almost didn't eat for 3-4 days. It was indescribable. And their eyes is the question of why. This is my home, you know, this is where I live, um, and I know these people, you know, they're, they're, they're very dear to me. We got the first delivery of equipment and trying to get everything set up. Usually we feed the kibbutz members and all the people that live here, but now we have uh, between 500 and 700 people extra. Food is a little escape from your problems and it's, you know, the common denominator. You would think why people want celebrations in the middle of a war. People need celebrations in the middle of a war. Celebrate life, celebrate that life goes on no matter what. The houses totally destroyed by the territory. And people live in tents. Everyone is in it, up to their knees, up to their waists, sweating. ما كانش يجينا مساعدة من قبل هيك إلا بس في يوم أجا وزع علينا مصدرة وزاك وسدينا منها الجوع. We were a team from everywhere for one reason to give a hot meal to give a hope for these people that are coming. Quaint walk-up apartments like this one behind me are a beloved feature in cities around the world. They're inviting and full of character. But here in North America, they are not allowed to be built today. Instead, our apartments are big and imposing, often stretching across an entire block. And the reason why really comes down to one reason. Staircases. This type of apartment building is called the point access block. Its defining feature is that all its units share one staircase and elevator to the ground floor, which allows for a smaller, skinnier apartment. And these buildings are a common element in some of the most desirable neighborhoods in the world. So why don't we build these apartments here in North America? Well, in Canada and the US, all apartments above two or three stories need to give their units access to two separate staircases. We're some of the only countries across the world that are this strict about this requirement. In most other places, it only kicks in after six or more stories. And this one rule has huge implications. Staircases take up a lot of space, and fitting two of them in a small building means that there's much less usable floor space on every floor. As a result, developers here construct much larger buildings so that the staircases and hallways take up a much smaller proportion of the overall building. It's why apartments in North America in general are much bigger and wider than their European counterparts. The reason I care about this issue is because this requirement is causing some major problems. For starters, 
is making it much more difficult to build more housing. Big buildings require big properties, and in many cases, finding a property large enough for a large apartment requires a land assembly. This is where you convince multiple landowners to sell their properties to you at the same time so that you can combine them into one big lot. As you can imagine, this is a risky process that requires negotiations, legal reviews, and a ton of money. Single staircase buildings, on the other hand, can be much smaller, which means you can often build them on just one property. I think that makes these buildings an important solution right now, because cities today are increasingly looking to add more housing into their single-family neighborhoods. Properties in these areas are already small to begin with, and I think it'd be very difficult to add more housing at scale without single staircase buildings. But this requirement isn't just making it more difficult to build new housing, it's also limiting the kinds of housing we can build. The reason why comes down to the hallway connecting the two staircases. It cuts the building in two, which means most of the units on either side of it can really only fit one bedroom. Why do we have this rule? Why does every apartment require two staircases? Well, to understand why, we have to go back in history, back to when cities across North America were adopting their first building codes. Back in the day, one of the biggest threats to your life in the city was dying in a fire. In fact, every now and then, an entire city would go up in flames. That's why cities across North America began to create robust fire safety regulations like this double staircase rule that's still in effect today. The idea behind it was quite simple. If you're in a building that's on fire, you don't want to be stuck with only one option to get out. But you might be wondering, why is it then that this rule is so strict in just North America? Well, cities in Asia and Europe had already dealt with this issue centuries before, but their approach was to require buildings to be made of more fireproof materials, like brick and stone. North American cities, on the other hand, were growing quickly, and it was much quicker to build out of wood than to painstakingly lay bricks and stones. Sprinkle in a little bit of classism around housing types, and you have our North American compromise for the building code. Build with less fireproof materials, but compensate with stricter regulations. But at least we got safer buildings. Well, that's not exactly true. As you can see on this chart, the US and Canada don't have the fewest fire deaths per capita. It turns out there are so many other factors that contribute towards fire safety. In fact, it seems like the real success story of our building codes hasn't been so much about helping people escape fires, but preventing them in the first place. Do we need this rule at all? Well, personally, I think that doing away with this rule altogether would be too drastic. It exists for a reason, and in my opinion, the problem isn't the rule itself, but just how broadly we've applied it. There are a few cities in North America that have made exemptions to this rule. For example, Seattle. In 1977, the city began allowing apartments up to six stories to have just one staircase, provided they comply with other safety regulations. Today, it's one of the few cities in North America where you can see modern single staircase buildings. After all, these codes are about our safety. But I do want to mention that these codes do change over time as our technology and our understanding of safety evolves. For example, the BC government recently amended its building code to increase the maximum height of wood buildings from 6 to 12 stories because of innovations in wood construction like mass timber that can make wood stronger and more fire resistant. It's important that we continue to discuss and update these rules as our world changes. So, the next time you're at a party, or visiting your family, or on a date, bring up staircases, or fire protection ratings, or dead-end conditions, and elevators. I mean, oh my gosh, so much to talk about elevators. Full rack of ribs. Chili's baby back ribs. The Baconator. Baconator is the ultimate bacon cheeseburger. Steak and eggs. Americans love meat. Mm. Meat. In the last 50 plus years, meat consumption in the U.S. increased by 40 percent placing it behind only Hong Kong for highest meat consumption in the world. Meat consumption in the United States has been abnormally high for centuries. When something good happens in your life and you go to celebrate, you're 
celebrating with the state. Culturally neat has become part of our story and part of at least our stereotype, if not our identity. To the average British colonist arriving in the 1600s, the amount of land available for farming was baffling. That's because back in Britain, land was controlled only by the upper class. Settlers took the opportunity to produce a luxury good in previously unheard of quantities. As early as the 1720s, farms were specializing in the production of meat animals intended to be sold in urban areas for the urban population. The availability of meat in America directly contrasted with countries like France, in which the king controlled the trade of livestock. You couldn't just you know, get a bunch of cows together, march them towards Paris, and sell them at, a, at an auction. No, that, had, that was all regulated and controlled. In America, land was plentiful and production of meat was decentralized. But then something happened that beefed up this already meaty business, the Industrial Revolution. Midwestern cities like Chicago had convenient access to surrounding rural lands nearby. This meant they could fatten the animals just outside the city and bring them back to a large industrial workforce for slaughter, packing, and transportation. As mechanical refrigeration continued to develop and the invention of the refrigerated rail car was introduced, it supercharged meatpacking into a year-round business. Refrigerated rail cars also allowed the transport of more meat to more people. Chicago, with its expanding railroad system, quickly grew into the meat processing capital of the U.S. Local farmers no longer sold their products directly to small town butchers. Instead, massive slaughterhouses were responsible for distribution. In other words, a centralized meatpacking industry was born. With the expansion of the industry, meat made its way onto the American dinner, lunch, and even breakfast plate. It not only satisfied our taste buds, but also became an item that was expected to be available. Periodically, there'd be price jumps because for a number of reasons and consumers would riot. But economists argue there's one thing it all boils down to in the end. If I were to ask you how Americans became so obsessed with meat, you would say? Americans became so obsessed with meat because we could afford it and we like it. Developing nations with new access to affordable quantities of meat may take their place. Because the more money a country has, the more meat they consume. And we have seen this in other countries where as their economy develops and, and their peoples have more disposable income, they start to put more meat into their diet. And if we know anything about meat accessibility, maybe one day those other countries will become just as obsessed as us Americans. Perfectly located on the Strand in Manhattan Beach is the Los Angeles County Lifeguard Training Center. A hundred years ago, the area was barely developed, but on this small sliver of sand was a kind of paradise where black Californians were welcome on what was called Bruce's Beach. There were two beaches in our area, this one and Santa Monica, Inkwell Beach. Janice Hahn is a Los Angeles County supervisor. And so people don't understand that they weren't even allowed. They were arrested in other places for swimming in the ocean. Here was lodging, a cafe, and a dance hall, all too much for local whites in a Los Angeles unashamed of its embrace of the Ku Klux Klan. So the fact that they were allowed to set up this resort and then the Ku Klux Klan so hated what they were doing because it was successful. Charles and Willa Bruce bought the land with money he earned as a cook on a Pullman car. They knew early on there'd be trouble. Willa Bruce told the Los Angeles Times in 1912, wherever we have tried to buy land for a beach resort, we have been refused. But I own this land, and I am going to keep it. But the Manhattan Beach Council thought otherwise. They condemned the property through eminent domain, claiming the area was needed for a park. The land sat vacant, unused, for decades. What does it mean to you now, though, then, to know that it's coming back to the Bruce family? Well, it's joyful and it's a bittersweet moment. I mean, we have generations that uh, build up generational wealth and then everything stopped at Manhattan Beach. And then the, this the, the family went through several tragedies. Derek Bruce is a great grandson of Charles and Willa Bruce. That's what our family has gone through is a grave wounding. Black, black.
The summer of 2020 was a season of awakening and reckoning. And during that time, returning the property to the Bruce family became a rallying cry. Today, that will happen, an act of reparation. As reparations and restitution cases go, this one probably will be the easiest to accomplish because we have the records that show the actual piece of property that was bought by Willa and Charles Bruce. And then we have the records of the harassment that they went through, the Ku Klux Klan actually trying to run them out of town. And we know when that didn't work, uh, the city decided to use eminent domain and take this property from them. Does this feel like justice to you? In a way it does. In a way it does feel like justice because the hardship that our family went through, went through generations and it just uh, echoed and, and reverberated without us really knowing why. The Bruce descendants will lease the land back to the county for now. The county has offered to buy it back from them for $20 million. Did you ever look at this spot and say what could have, what should have, dream um, about what? I took my wife here one time and, and, and my kids, and um, you know we just, we just kind of just basked in the thought what could have been. But it was such a, a fleeting moment and so unrealistic that we didn't really dwell on it. Yeah, yes. I bet. And Although, here, look at where, where we are now, so I guess it right? wasn't that unrealistic after all. <laughs> Generations ago, the folks here were not very kind to your grandparents. Yes, uh, but we have to learn from, uh, from others' uh, mistakes, and we have to understand that uh, there is a path forward to uh, human beings treating each other uh, with respect and dignity. It's uh, something that we should reach forward together.